so Kevin, Kevin is working at, at, at uh, Shopify, which basically, if you want to take your, my, my way of translate, tell me if I'm wrong here, Kevin, but if you want to take your business online and cover off everything from the shop and the payments and all the rest of it, you can get it all done at Shopify. Absolutely. And Kevin actually, yep, so okay, got the definition correct. Kevin's been working there pretty much from the start and when he was one of the first designers, or the first designer that they had, so his employee number is very small and pretty much everybody else came after him and that is several hundred people at this stage, if I'm correct there, Kevin, right? Yeah, so we have stats internally and so 98% of the company joined after me, which is crazy. <laughs> There you go. One of the, <laughs> excellent. And so Kevin's going to talk to us today about something that uh, I think speaks a little bit to the uh, perfectionist or the artist in all of us about the road to perfection and what that means for us. And uh, I'm just going to hand over to you, Kevin. I'll come back in towards the end while, when, when we hit about the, the 40 minute mark. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Everybody, cheers. Perfect. All right. Thank you. Um, uh, so I just want to tell everyone in the chat, uh, I have this kind of crazy setup here. And so while I'm going to present my slides, I'm not going to be able to see your comments, unfortunately. And so uh, we'll see if we have time for questions at the end. Uh, definitely like keep out the chat. You can chat amongst yourselves, but just know that I won't be able to see it, unfortunately. And so at the end, if we have some time, I'll jump in there and can answer some of your questions. Cool, so let me try to connect this. All right, so hi everyone. I'm super happy to get a chance to talk to you today. My name is Kevin, and I'm a UX manager at Shopify on the Shopify email team. But before that, I led the design team on our checkout. So if you bought something from any of these stores, that means you've used the checkout from, that was designed by me and my team. And this is what it looks like. Might sound familiar. I also have a design podcast with my co-host, Rafa, where we talk about what's going on in the design world and where we welcome the occasional guests to tell us more about their design philosophy. In the last few years, we've produced over 200 hours of audio, and we have listeners from all around the world. On top of that, I'm also the founder of the Montreal Design Club, which is a community for designers in Montreal and where we host events of all kinds. Obviously, we've had to reimagine what the sense of community looks like in this current environment, uh, but that's not what I want to talk to you about today. I want to start this presentation with a question I asked myself when I was putting together this talk. What are you obsessed about? So I'd like you to take a moment and think about that. Like, what, does, what are you obsessed about? For me, I'm obsessed with excellence. I'm fascinated by it. Whether it's physical products, architecture, or software, I'm obsessed with products that go above and beyond and solve problems in a new and interesting way. Now, I say that I'm obsessed with excellence, but I think in a way, all of us are. Every one of us who do creative work, we get into it because we have good taste. We can tell the excellent from the mediocre, but when we look at our own work, it often feels like there's a gap. What you're making is good, but it's not that good. And your taste that got you into this is still excellent. And your taste is, well, good enough to tell you that what you're making is kind of a little appointment. So for the past few years, I've been desperately trying to close the gap between what my taste recognizes as excellent and what I'm able to produce in my own work. So today, I'll be talking to you about three unconventional ideas that I've uncovered on my quest for excellence. The first idea is that solving problems is easy. And look, I know this is controversial, but to illustrate that idea, let me tell you about a story. The story I wanna tell you about is a story of how human-powered flight was invented. It started off with a prize that was created by Henry Kramer in 1959 that would be awarded to the first person to create a human-powered plane. So years and years go by, 
and tons of people take, try to take a stab at that problem. But for 18 years, nobody could solve it until all of a sudden, an engineer out of nowhere solved this problem within six months of even trying. His name is Paul McCready. This is 1976, and Paul is in serious trouble. He owes $100,000 that he used to start a company that completely failed. And that's when he hears about the prize. If only he could win this prize, he would finally be able to pay off his debt. So he starts working away at trying to solve this problem. And he eventually realizes that the problem was the problem itself. McCready realized that what needed to be solved was not, in fact, human-powered flight. So he came up with a new problem that he set out to solve. How can you build a plane that could be rebuilt in hours, not months? So he built a plane with mylar, aluminum tubing, and wire. Those are materials that could easily recover from, him, from an impact. And as soon as he put the finger on the right problem, the solution became easy. While others needed a year's worth of effort for each test flight, he created a plane that he could fly, fix, and fly again in mere hours, which was completely revolutionary and changed the course of the aviation industry and ultimately awarded him the Kremer Prize. As soon as I heard this story, I couldn't help but notice that in my own work, I was focusing so much energy on the solution and not enough on the problem itself. A common practice in our work, which I'm sure many of you have heard of, is UX research. And when we start doing research, one of the things that you learn quickly is how much your questions can bias the answers. So for example, asking a question like, did you enjoy the experience, will yield a lot more positive answers than a more neutral question would, like, what did you think of the experience? So the exact same thing happens with a problem you're trying to solve. The problem you focus on will define the solution you create. So if I wanted to improve my work, I would have to start asking better questions. And the analogy I often make is the doctor and the patient. So most of the time, the patient will come in and saying like, ow, my arm hurts. But that's only really the symptom. It's a doctor's job to ask questions and figure out what is the root cause of the problem. So I want to show you two examples of how I applied this into my own work. So here's the first one. We recently were tasked with adding Apple Pay as a payment method for our checkout. And this seemed like a fairly straightforward project. We already had a bunch of payment methods. We could simply add Apple Pay to the list. But we started with the simplest question of all. Why? What's the point of all of this? You see, by adding yet another payment method to that list, it seemed like we would only make it harder for people to decide how they want to complete their checkout, not easier. And we knew that if we kept adding more and more payment options to our checkout, it would eventually start looking like this. So ultimately, we realized that the problem wasn't that we needed to add Apple Pay to checkout. That's not even a problem. The real problem was much bigger. The problem was that uh, it's time consuming to have to do a lot of typing, especially on mobile. So our question became, how might we help people choose a payment method that is right for them and will give them the smoothest experience? So with this question in mind, we knew that we couldn't just add a payment method to the list and call it a day. It would simply introduce even more decision paralysis for people. So we decided that we would leverage signals like which browser you're using and whether you have a card saved or not to surface the payment method that you're the most likely to want to use. So if you have Apple Pay, we'll show you that. And if you have PayPal, we'll show you PayPal. According to our research, the accuracy of our prediction is really high. But of course, you can still choose any other payment method you want. But for the first time, we were helping you make a decision instead of throwing tons of options at you. So by personalizing the interface, we allow our checkout to adapt to you, the user, instead of making you adapt to it. And since we narrowed down the list of buttons to a single recommendation, it allowed us to include it on the product page, saving time for all the people who buy a single item. 
You see, once we started asking the right questions, the solution became very simple. It allowed us to make purposeful decisions that benefit our buyers. So we have a saying at work that goes like this, fall in love with the problem, not the solution. Falling in love with the problem is so important to us that every four months, everyone in the company gets to spend three days to focus on the problem that they care the most about. As you might imagine, in my seven years at Shopify, I've done a lot of different projects, but one of them was Frenzy. Frenzy is an app for iOS and Android that is dedicated to creating a tailored experience for limited release products like sneakers. We had been hearing a lot of feedback from our merchants about how frustrating the experience of selling these high demand products was. On one hand, the customers were frustrated because products would sometimes sell out in a matter of seconds. And our merchants were frustrated because, well, their customers were frustrated. And because a lot of the inventory ended up being bought in bulk by people using bots to later resell them and make a huge profit off of it, making these products even more of a status or a luxury item. So we initially set out to remove the friction of buying this um, in this high pressure environment. But halfway through the three days allocated for this project, remember again, this was a high phase project, uh, we realized that we were looking at the problem the wrong way. Our merchants didn't want a, simply, uh, a slightly simpler flow because they knew they would sell out for sure. And our buyer's main source of frustration was that they couldn't get the item that they wanted. Not that there was too much friction. What our merchants really wanted was to give people a good experience, even if they didn't end up getting the product. So we realized that removing friction isn't always a solution and that in order to solve the problem, we might have to actually add friction. So we went back to the drawing board and we designed the experience around that. We tried to make these sales feel like an event. We made it so that the longer you had the app open on your screen, the more chances you would get to buy the product. Essentially, you're in this virtual lineup. Um, and keeping your screen on at all times added a lot of friction to the experience. But for the first time, the biggest fan who were willing to put in the more work would get a leg up. And we also wanted to make people feel more connected to each other. So each new person that joined would be represented by a lightning bolt floating up the screen. And so when the time came, the app finally revealed the store, which was ready for you to buy something. Our project got enough traction that we actually formed a team around it to turn it into a real product. And while I wasn't directly as involved with the project anymore, the team pursued an idea called Drop Zones. The way Drop Zones work is that the store can set up a geofence around the area you have to be in to purchase, like a park, for example. And when the sale opens, only those brave enough to leave their living room are able to purchase the product. With this feature, not only people had more chances to get the sneakers they want, but the app also brought people together around the shared interests. So we've actually made people's experience better, even if they never got the product. Now, obviously, the footage you're seeing now is uh, from last year in a, a pre-COVID world. Um, so something like this would not be possible in the same way anymore. Um, but I think the idea still stands. And we would have never gotten to those kinds of solutions if we hadn't reframed the problem first. So if I have to sum it up, always question the problem you're being asked to solve. You'll find that the real problem you need to solve is rarely the one you begin with. It's your role to find the source of the problem, because if you get that wrong, every single decision you make after that is irrelevant. Now, once you're confident that you're asking the right questions and you've found the right problem, how do you solve it? How do you make sure that you find the right solution? Well, my second unconventional idea is that if you care about excellence, you sometimes have to prioritize quantity over quality. I'll let that sink in for a second. Okay, let me explain you what I mean. And for that, I want to tell you about the story 
that stuck with me ever since I read it for the first time six years ago in this book called Art and Fear. This is a story about a ceramics teacher. On the first day of school, the ceramics teacher decided to do an experiment. For the whole semester, he would be dividing the class into two groups. All of those on the right side of the studio would be graded solely on the quantity of their work. And all those on the left would be graded solely on its quality. And when came grading time, a curious fact emerged. The works of highest quality were all being produced by the group being graded for quantity. It seems like while the, the quantity group was busy churning out piles and piles of work and learning from their mistakes, the quality group had kind of sat there, they were theorizing about perfection, and in the end, had little more to show for their efforts than gr these grandiose theories and a pile of dead clay. Look, this story probably never happened for real, <laughs> but I think there's some interesting learnings to be had there. And the first one is that it's really, really hard to come up with something great on your first try. Can you imagine the pressure? And this is why so many of us have the white page syndrome when we sit down and write. The second learning is that if you believe that in the universe of possible solutions, there is an optimal solution to the problem you're fixing, which I do, like I don't think all solutions are equal in how well they solve the problem, then what's the likelihood that the first solution you try will be the best one? It's probably more likely that you'll end up here, or maybe here, or here. By exploring as many ideas as possible, you cover a much wider range, and you're much more likely to hit on a concept that works. I call this design by brute force. So the reason why quantity works is because your inner critic will eliminate many ideas that have potential before you can actually refine them. So the key here is that by making a lot of things, you have to separate the creator from the critic. I see this process as something similar to an author printing out their manuscript to edit with a red pen. You really wanna have this like clear separation between when you're creating and when you're evaluating your work. So instead of mixing solutions with critique, you wanna get all of your solutions out of the way first, then critique, and ultimately make a decision. I used this process when I was working on the order status page project at Shopify. Our goal for this project was to be more transparent about the status of orders to increase people's confidence in our merchants. A lot of these explorations took place on paper, but for the sake of this presentation, I'll show you three high fidelity versions of concepts that we've explored. So the first one had this map, was very visual. The second one was more of a timeline. And the third one had sort of a card style design. Once you have all of your ideas, now's the time to put your critic hat on. In this process, you wanna be as objective as possible and gather feedback from lots of different sources. So the visual one was engaging, but it was missing a lot of key information. The timeline design was clever and had the most information, but it was a little hard for people to tell the current status of their order. And the card design made the current state much more clear, but it was hard to get a sense of what comes next. So we decided to eliminate the timeline idea and merge the other two designs to create this. During the course of this project, we've explored about 30 different card designs. And to further separate the creator from the critic, I actually ended up printing all 30 cards and putting them on the wall to write on them and vote on the ones that resonated the most. And this is the final design we settled on in the end, which solved all of the problems we had uncovered in our research. Um, and what was interesting is that in that process, we actually had to discard a lot of good ideas in order to get to the best one, which is another reminder of how important it is to fall in love with a problem, not the solution. A few years later, we've stumbled on a similar problem that we wanted to tackle. Um, in, in this app called Arrive. So Arrive in, in, is an app that collects all of your orders all in one place to make sure you don't miss anything. It's placing control into people's hands, quite literally in this case. So as you see, this is a similar problem and we 
were lucky enough to get a second take, do a second pass at solving the same problem. And so with each iteration, we've gotten closer and closer to our ideal, and you can see how we've refined those ideas. And that made me realize that you might not reach excellence the first time you take a swing at something, and that's OK. But just like Paul McCready did with Human Heart Flight, you just have to keep trying. OK, so the third idea I want to tell you about is don't specialize. Let's face it, our society really wants specialization. I think that is best articulated by Malcolm Gabwell's 10,000 hour rules that says you need 10,000 hours of deliberate practice in order to become a world class expert at anything. And he's talked to the best chess grandmasters, violinists, golf players, and the one thing they all had in common was that relentless practice of their craft. So if we follow this rule, the only true way to become excellent is time and focus. So it goes without saying that if you do multiple things at once, you're essentially just dividing your time across all of these interests, which is severely increasing the time it takes for you to master any of them. And this idea is where the quote, jack of all trades, master of none, comes from. And I'm sure all of you have heard this before. Like, I'm not teaching you anything new here. But what many of us don't know is that that's not the full quote. The full quote actually goes like this. Jack of all trades, master of none, but oftentimes better than a master of one. So for this last segment of my talk, I'd like to try and convince you that being a well-rounded person is a completely valid way to achieve excellence. So how do we reconcile this idea of 10,000 hours with the fact that the exact opposite of specialization is what people, makes people like me successful? Well, it turns out that author David Epstein asked himself the exact same questions. And he discovered that there is actually two different types of domains. There are kind and there are wicked domains. Time domains are domains like golf, chess, or poker, where there are defined boundaries, consequences are quickly apparent, and similar challenges re occur repeatedly. And this is when specialization is desirable. Wicked domains are domains like politics, management, technology, and design. And in wicked domains, the rules of the game are often unclear, or maybe they're incomplete. There may or may not be repetitive patterns, and they may not be obvious. And the feedback you get is often delayed, inaccurate, or both. So as you might have guessed, in these types of environments, having a broad pool of skills is very important. In most wicked environments, experience can reinforce the exact wrong lessons and give people a false sense of confidence instead of approaching problems with a beginner's mindset. In my own career, I've always done a ton of different things. I'm a designer who also does a lot of programming, who organizes events, hosts a podcast, who does product management, so on and so forth. And the biggest secret of my career is that each new thing that I learn improves every other aspect of my life. So rather than dividing my impact, having multiple skills allows me to grow exponentially. So being a designer makes me a better developer and vice versa. So here's an example. This is Climate. It's a project that I worked on for fun when the Apple Watch first came out. I didn't like how the native Apple Watch app displayed weather, so I set out to design and build my own. And I was really excited about this, getting this graph that would show rain intensity, because God knows it can rain a lot in Montreal. And the only issue was there was no way to render something like this on the Apple Watch in the first version. But I figured out that I could pre-render the graph on the iPhone, capture an image of it, and then send it over to the watch to finally be able to get the experience I wanted. It took me a really long time to build this. And frankly, like most developers and product managers, would have never obsessed over this seemingly small feature as much as I would have. But a few months later, this skill came in handy when it came time to design the Shopify app for Apple Watch. Look, we obviously knew that people didn't want to manage their store from the wrist. 
but getting rich notifications and stats would be really useful. So we actually decided to reuse the code that I wrote for my silly side project in order to get the experience that we wanted for the Shopify app. A similar example, uh, my interest for photography led me to design and build Photo Edit, which is a photo editing app that lets me edit photos just the way I want it, right from my phone. And in the process, I've learned a ton about creating performant interfaces and manipulating images through code, which is still useful. Having a podcast helped me a lot as a design lead at Shopify. Last year, we started selling stickers to our listeners which allowed me to truly dog food our product for the very first time. I have learned so much about the challenges that our merchants face every day, and I leverage these learnings from that experience to translate that into product solutions that make the lives of our merchants better. So I wanna like, make sure that you understand and like, make it really crystal clear that your overlap of skills is what makes you uniquely skilled at solving that problem. So there can be a lot of people that have experience in A and a lot of experience in B, but there will be so much fewer people that have experience in both A and B, whatever these things are for you. One thing that I can do also is lead to completely new solutions to existing problems. Okay, so let me give you an example of what I mean by that. So let's imagine this problem. You're a merchant, your customers love your product but you still keep getting a lot of returns because people have a hard time getting a sense of the scale of your products online. So if you're a designer, how would you solve this problem? Well, a traditional designer would probably find ways to make the dimensions more visible on this product page. So maybe something like this. So that way, you know, people can take a look and measure, measure themselves. Or maybe you think a little bit longer and realize maybe not everyone has like a tape measure or ruler around to try to like figure that out. So maybe you would photograph the object next to an object that we, we all have to get a sense of the scale. And that's a little bit better, but still not necessarily the most optimal solution. Now let's imagine another designer with a 3D background who's approaching this exact same problem. Well, their solution is going to be very different. They might decide to create a 3D render of a product to let buyers preview the items in their own homes before buying. Well, this is exactly what our AR and VR team did in partnership with one of our merchants named Magnolia. So the way it works is you open the app and you find uh, the product you want. And in the carousel, you have an option to preview the object into your own home. So to do that, you simply open the camera. It lets you scan the surface you want to put the item on. And what, what's great about this is like, you can walk around. You can see what the object looks precisely in your space. You can get up close. You can rotate it. Um, you can also take a picture and get some feedback from your friends and family. It really provides this much richer experience for buying things online. And as all of us have realized, that's becoming more and more important as we don't necessarily want to go into a physical store anymore. So having that different kind of experience really made this, this project come to life and brought on totally innovative solutions. But I'm not saying that you should start 3D modeling, and I'm not saying you should start coding, or I'm not saying that you should start a podcast. But what I'd love is if more people gave themselves the permission to explore their own interests. So take a second look at your interests and see what you might be able to apply in your own work and try to draw these parallels or these connections. And to show you it's possible, I want to give you three examples of people that have leveraged their different passions in order to achieve unique things. The first one is Sarah Berry. Sarah is a UX researcher on the checkout team at Shopify. So typical research goes like this. You find a diverse set of participants, you give them a task, and then you ask them some questions to get their thoughts. 
And we've been doing that for a really long time. But in our recent interviews, people would often look at an interface and say like, yeah, it's fine. Like, it was pretty easy. You know, it was re relatively simple. It was clean, whatever. But more and more, we kind of had that feeling that we weren't really getting the full picture of what they really thought. So because Sarah spent over a decade teaching and conducting mental health and bioethics research in academia prior to joining Shopify, she decided to use a device called EEG, which is typically used to detect brain damage. And what it does is it captures uh, the wave of how much brain activity is going on at any given moment. We use this not as a replacement for asking questions, but in addition to it. And with this device, we were able to discover discrepancies between what the participant told us and how their brain was reacting to the interface. So for example, when people are looking to uh, a card page, there's a ton of activity going on in their brain as they're trying to figure out how much they're going to have to pay for shipping. Am I getting the right quantity? Am I getting the right item? And most people just kind of like accept that. And with this, we were able to discover that there's actually a lot of work that we can do there to make our products better. And so that combination of signals allowed us to get so much more accurate information, which led to significant user experience improvements. This next example is my friend Stefan Robusto, who's a creative director and a DJ. And when most people would have decided one career or another, Stefan actually decided to do both. So he founded his own agency that is part design and part record label. And his process is really interesting. Whenever he creates campaigns for his clients, he often starts with writing the music for it, rather than just slapping on some music at the end. And that gives him a completely different approach to solving creative problems. And that is exactly the reason why his clients come to his agency. Last but not least is Cynthia Irony who's a super talented product designer from Montreal. A few years ago, she took her design skills and decided to apply them to designing cakes. And the result was a completely new style, which spread like wildfire after she started posting on Instagram. Her unique combination of skill set was a huge part of what allowed her to set herself apart from the design, uh, the, the rest of the industry, and allowed her to make a name for herself. So we're all on this road to excellence. On my way, I've learned that working harder is rarely the answer. And often, if you can't solve a problem, that means you're probably looking at it the wrong way. Once you put the finger on the right problem, the solution will come easy. I've also learned to rethink my process and separate the creator from the critic. I'm now at peace with quantity not being completely opposed to quality, and I've learned to use it as a tool to solve hard problems. And finally, I've learned that it's okay not to specialize. In fact, it might be better. Being a well-rounded person helps you make connections between various fields and gives you a unique take on problems. Each of these unconventional ideas is bringing me ever and ever closer to the ideal I have in my head. While I initially thought that the road to excellence would look something like this, I've discovered that real life looks a lot more like that. As much as I would like you to follow the road that I'm on, the reality is that there's many ways to get there. And the destination isn't finite. Because your taste, your taste is still evolving and getting better every single day. So I encourage you to find what works for you. Find your own path. Don't be afraid to step outside of the norm because unconventional ideas are often the most powerful ones. Thank you. So I'll switch over to this. Oh, thanks. Sorry, I was waiting. It was taking a while to come in. <laughs> thanks, Kevin. That was great. I, I, I certainly go for the uh, love the problem, not the solution. 
and separate the creative from the critic. Although I must admit, Wicked Domains has opened up. Uh, you know, this is something I think I'm going to get a lot of use at in the, of in the future. I think I like the idea of Wicked Domains. That's that's pretty cool. But cool. That, thank you very much. And uh, it's lovely to see. Well, it's lovely to see these things put in a graphical form that you can actually. It makes it so much more tangible than if it's if you know when we're just talking about it. So that's great. Thank you so much. Nice. Thank you. Um, just for everybody else, we're about to uh, finish up here and go over to the main stage where we'll just do the closing um, for today. And um, thanks once again, Kevin. Really, thank you very much. Thank uh, you so much, everyone. Really appreciate you uh, like coming to see my talk. And uh, yeah, time for a beer for you. <laughs> and just so you know, Kevin, you had over 100 people uh, at the talk the whole way through. Yeah. So That's thanks. amazing. Yeah, yeah. That's and, super um, cool. There's my beer. <laughs> <laughs> ah, nice. I wasn't Perfect. joking. <laughs> hey, Kev, thanks a lot, okay? Uh, take care. Okay. And, uh, hope to Have see you. Have a great day, everyone. Cheers. Bye. Bye.